Welcome to Renegade Inc. In a rare moment of candor, the then Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan gave us an insight into what he feels are the optimum conditions for workers. The so-called healthy economy that he presided over owed its success to what he called growing worker insecurity. You see, workers with precarious existences are not going to make demands. And it's this compromised position, coupled with diminishing wages, that is the cornerstone to the global gig economy. Shannon Walsh, welcome to Renegade Inc. Great to have you on the programme. Thank you so much for having me. Shannon, uh, your film, The Gig Is Up, uh, it's all about the gig economy, precarious employment and exploitation of workers. Just give us a, a, a brief summation of uh, the film and why you made it. Yeah, so the gig is up really gets behind the technology to take a look at um, the people who actually arrive at your doorstep and do the things behind the app that you tap. So. Um, easily on your phone. So um, I really wanted to tell the story of um, who are those people, because so often they're written out of the story of technology. And so the film is kind of a global expose, expose that looks at people all over the world who are doing this kind of work. And uh, what was the impulse to make it? Because it's um, surprising to me that this film hasn't been made before now. Yeah, myself, I was even surprised as I started on the journey to think, wow, people haven't focused in on the people doing the work behind technology. My own fascination had started, um, you know, I'd been interested in the evolution of fourth wave capitalism and what did it look like to think about um, our techno utopianism. So my last film, I'd really thought about how does that look when we think that technology is going to save us from environmental crisis and lets us kick it down the road, um, this kind of illusion that technology will save us. And so in this film, um, I was thinking that through human labor and what did it look like when we thought technology hides and gives us an illusion of magic that's happening um, by a bunch of guys in, in button-up shirts when actually it's everyday people who are um, often working under conditions that um, would be unacceptable even 100 years ago. So I was really, really curious to, to kind of unpack how also technology sometimes is a, is a foil that allows certain kinds of practices and illusions to, to hide behind. And um, when you started, films, of course, always change filmmakers. You, you start at a point, you don't really know where you're going to get to by the time you get to the end of it. What changed most uh, in, during that journey, if I can put it that way, uh, for you personally? Yeah, for me, I definitely understood the gig economy as something resembling more like what I did at the beginning, you know, understanding it a bit more of like precarious work that is piecemeal work, like what we saw at the early um, turn of the century. Um, through researching the film and understanding that the platform economy presents a whole new type of mechanism um, for how work is organized across the board. It's not only in these tiny bits of, of uh, occasional work of someone delivering food to your house or helping AI. That was a real revelation for me and understanding what um, algorithms had to play, the way that labor laws had really roll, rolled back. Um, I learned a ton about that and definitely that 80% of this work is happening behind screens, is invisible, what Mary Gray calls ghost work. Um, that was incredibly fascinating to me and I, and I uh, veered quite a bit in the film to try to cover some of that. Um, and I didn't know that in, in setting out on the project. Isn't it fascinating that uh, the vast majority of these companies and certainly ones that you cover in the film, all of them lose money hand over fist on, a, on an annual basis? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as uh, as Nick Schnernick says in the film, it is uh, it, there's something deeply wrong with contemporary capitalism. If we can be watching people making millions of dollars at the same time as saying that their companies are losing money and people are being deeply exploited. Like there is there is a whole story to tell um, around VC capital companies not going public, like the way that that, that this type of business model is set up. 
um, that creates the deepest kind of exploitation, has no accountability for creating actual revenue as a normal business would. I'd often talk to my mom about it, you know, my mom of different generation. And, you know, you can't get your head around, well, wait, the business doesn't actually make money. Like, isn't, why wouldn't it just fail? And yet we're, they're celebrated, they're on the Super Bowl, you know, like, you know, the, they're, they're putting money in every event and, and presenting themselves as these real um, innovators where in fact they're, they're failing business models that are only propped up through people looking for fast money through um, really nefarious means and exploiting workers in the process. If you wake up on a Castor mattress and you work out on a Peloton bike and then you Uber to your office at WeWork and you DoorDash lunch at WeWork, you come home on an Uber or Lyft, maybe you Lime scooter to your actual door and then you use some other delivery service like Postmates in order to have dinner, you've then interacted with eight companies that this year are probably going to lose somewhere between 10 and $15 billion. I mean, that is an unbelievable fact about the semi-permanent subsidization of our habits. And you have to think, how long can this go on? It is not in capitalism's long-term interest to simply subsidize the average habits of the, your typical urban upper middle class millennial. I call this the millennial lifestyle subsidy, right? Every single time that you're using DoorDash or using Uber, you're getting a little bit of money back from these companies. They're saying, we're never going to charge you as much as the service actually costs. So I think it's ironic, I think it's interesting, and I also think it just can't last. It's incredible, isn't it, that in so-called capitalist America, uh, that there's this form of sort of startup socialism where they just keep cash burn uh, going, <laughs> uh, and everyone's trying to outspend each other, and your sort of ego and your reputation becomes all about how much money other people's money you can spend uh, and and how quickly yeah it's um it's quite incredible when you think it's it's almost like this um, you know, uh, the Marcel Mauss book, The Gift, where you actually, to show your wealth, you burn, you burn uh, wealth, wealth itself, you know, and it's like we're in this kind of backwards type of time. Um, and the subsidization, I think the idea of network effects and what it takes to get dominance means throwing money basically into the wind. Um, to sort of take over. But what is the actual real world impacts of that? Um, I think that that's something that people don't take into account almost at all, and especially environmental impacts. Like, you know, th these businesses are not without impacts on the physical world. This isn't just happening in an app. This is real people's lives and they're real physical objects, physical um, impacts on, on the planet. There has to be in this story uh, a, um, let's say, really underhand way that uh, tech companies go about recruiting their products. And when I say their products, I mean people. Because if you don't know what the product is, the likelihood is that you're the product, right? Uh, and um, what they do uh, and what you've uh, covered is that if they have a monopoly, they'll give away uh, uh, you know, to workers at a reduced rate, subsidized rate, at the beginning. And then once workers are signed up and have all sorts of dependents and liabilities, they'll then start pulling back those benefits and leaving that worker uh, totally exploited. Were you amazed at the scale of this? I was honestly shocked by this kind of bait and switch method that I, I didn't realize that was happening myself, you know, and it's happening at the consumer side too. So we can also uh, see it at the consumer side where you're given sort of bonuses, freebies, you know, um, think about the the times where they're like, oh, you know, get the first three for 50% off, or, you know, you get these huge rebates to becoming part of the, and you know that there's no way that you're paying what it's actually worth. And then on the worker side, because the lack of regulation, because of the slippage between people being employees and independent contractors, um, the idea that you can pull back rates entirely of what people are being paid without any oversight, you don't even have to notify the customers, you don't have to notify the, the workers themselves that that's happening, and you can pick and choose what you decide to pay different workers at different times as well. Um, it's it's beyond the pale that 100 years of labor organizing is just being erased um, in the snap of the fingers through the illusion of some kind of innovation here. And the innovation is just greater terms of exploitation. And I think we really have to wake up as a society that if this is going to be the new way we organize work, 
there's got to be a totally different type of conversation on the kind of legislation and the kind of regulation that needs to be behind it to be able to stop this type of deep exploitation happening and give some support to workers. Platform capitalism is the emergence of a new sort of business model becoming increasingly dominant across the economy. Platforms are intermediaries between a number of different groups. Uber is a platform, Amazon is a platform. So they're all connecting all of these different groups and allowing them to sort of interact in various ways and make money in various ways. So one of the unique things about digital platforms is um, their use and dependence on network effects. So the more people who use a platform, the more valuable that platform becomes for everybody else. So network effects lead to the sort of winner-takes-all model. This has driven Facebook, it's driven Google, it's driven Amazon, uh, and it's driving Uber right now as well. So there's a number of ways to, to sort of get network effects going. One way, so Uber has done, for instance, is provide subsidies. When Uber first moves into a city, they'll offer discounts to riders, and they'll offer sort of very high pay for drivers. So this means drivers flock to the platform, riders flock to the platform, and you get those network effects going. And then eventually, Uber decides, well, we're going to start cutting the pay, we'll cut back the discounts, we'll start charging higher prices. So once they've got network effects growing, they've got a sort of quasi-monopoly position, they can then dictate the terms of the market. Market. You mentioned before we play that clip that it's the oldest uh, trick in the book, isn't it? Bait and switch. But it's a lot worse than that now, isn't it? Because if you are a single mum or a father or you have a family and, and you have dependents and you have outgoings, actually there's no recourse to justice or there's no recourse to going back to uh, the company that you're working for and saying, actually, this is exploitation. You just have to sit down and take the medicine, don't you? Yeah, I think that one of the the tricky parts of this type of um, organized, uh, this type of work, the way it's organized is that it's harder than ever for workers to organize collectively. But, you know, I think that um, we are seeing around the world that people are being able to do that. But um, it, to your point of what work can you go back to? I mean, one of the things I found all over the world is there's people that are, are um, outside of formal employment, not only because there's less and less of formal employment, but also also because um, of various types of reasons that people are excluded, whether that be caring for sick parents or um, being uh, single parents themselves, or perhaps having a disability or, um, you know, in the U.S., a felony. Um, and you see that people are either shut out or, or they're, um, you know, migrants, for example, people that are working without, um, without documentation that are are cast out. And as those categories grow, the companies are more and more able to exploit people in which they know that they are stuck with this kind of work and that there's not another option waiting for them on the other side. Um, and, you know, often the retort is, why don't people just quit if it's not a good job? And I think that really misses um, the bigger picture of the economic situation that, that we're facing both globally, but also um, as these categories of, of folks who are completely shut out from whatever jobs that do remain also exist. So, um, and there's also a way in which the companies get their hooks um, in um, by having workers have to um, pay for the externalized costs, whether that be your car, your phone, all of the things that you have to invest into. You know, many of the drivers, for example, invest in um, higher end vehicles because that gets them the higher paid wages at first. Those wages get cut. They still have the leases to pay. You know, you get trapped into a cycle in which you're also constantly um, needing to be hyper vigilant for the next job that comes in. And it doesn't really afford you the time to say, okay, let me like now go back on the job job hunt. So it sort of sinks its claws into you and it becomes very difficult to, to um, exit from as well. So there's a huge combination of factors that, that um, work against workers in this case. I pay a lot of attention to the rates, and I can just tell within six months that my money was declining. I can make a possible 2000 a week to now I make hopefully $1,000. So that's 50%. My car is running down to the point where 
I just don't know one day I'm gonna go to my car and it's just not gonna start. Uber has managed to externalize the cost of workers to workers themselves. They force workers to basically um, be independent contractors and then try and take revenue through the transactions that occur on the platform. That is effectively their business model. Uber and Lyft, those companies, they pay the most intelligent people in the world. Professors, programmers, everything you can imagine. And they forgot about the drivers. We have no voice to that companies at all. I was making $1.95 a mile. Now I'm making 60 to 66 cents. It doesn't make any sense. I'm an activist when I was in my country, and when I come to this country, I know a lot of people, they're gonna need me. When we wanna do an action, some people, they don't wanna be in the media. Some people, they just, they get scared. Oh, Uber, they're gonna know about me and deactivate. If you are 4.7 and less, they deactivate your account, by the way, if you are a driver. Deactivate mean fired, mean no money for your family. So how can I work all that stress? It's not good. We consider it as a self-contractor, but we cannot refuse passengers. We cannot do certain things. You have to go or you're gonna be deactivate. Shannon Walsh, welcome back to Renegade Inc. In that first half, we uh, really went over the problems that uh, the, you cover in your film, The Gig Is Up. And in that break, we were just talking and you promised that well, there's going to be some optimism at the end because actually uh, we need a bit. Um, what, when you were making the film, when the, when the film uh, crystallised, uh, did you understand the, uh, the, the scale of the exploitation, not just in America, but globally? I mean, because it's breathtaking. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the short answer is no, I didn't really totally get my head around that how deeply global it is. Um, one of the revelations I had while making the film was, you know, in I came up during the, the era when we had a kind of anti-globalization movement and we thought a lot about um, where, you know, this outsourcing of jobs into places where there was lower wages and whatnot. And one of the things I saw with the platform economy is a kind of flattening globally, where you can see that this type of work, literally the same job on Mechanical Turk or something like that for the same wage is happening in Nigeria, in India, in the south of the US, in Britain. Right. Um, so you've got this, this kind of flattening happening. And I think that is a really new, that, that kind of um, gl global have and have nots is quite phenomenal. And, and I think it is different. The mechanism there is one of uh, inequality, and it's not going away, is it? Uh, by creating this film, how much sort of sucker and and, um, uh, and support have you given to what were basically ghost workers? I mean, no one was looking, were they? They must. You must have a lot of emails from people who are in the precarious gig economy saying, "Thank you very much. This is our plight, and you've highlighted it." Absolutely. People are really, you know, literally, especially for the ghost workers, I'm sure people watching this show right now, some of them will say, oh, yeah, I did some of that type of work. I've done some of that work. It's very um, uh, um, ubiquitous now, much more so than we understand. And, and I think that, you know, I hope with the film, one of the things we've really been able to capture is um, what it looks like for people because it's been totally invisible. Um, other than Mary Gray's book, Ghost Work, I really hadn't seen almost any representation of this type of work. And it's not that new, <laughs> you know, it has been happening. And anything you have that has to do with an algorithm or AI or anything like that has absolutely had people that have contributed creative um, intelligence to it. Moi, ça me donne encore plus de force pour me dire, putain, on lâchera rien. Eux, ils pensent qu'ils commandent et on arrive à la maison. Mais comment on arrive à la maison on grille des feux rouges, on se met en danger, on, on passe devant des camions, on passe devant des trams, on monte des montagnes. On n'arrive pas à la maison comme ça, on se téléporte pas, nous. On n'est pas des génies. Non, nous, on est, on est des humains. 
Certes, il y a un algorithme qui nous gère, mais nous, on est les personnes physiques. Tous ces gens-là qui, qui ont des accidents euh, sont à chaque fois les choses qui vont faire en sorte qu'on avance. C'est malheureux qu'on en soit là, mais enfin, les gens disent que, en fin de compte, les, les sociétés n'avancent que par des catastrophes, des cataclysmes qui font que les gens euh, prennent conscience de quelque chose. L'algorithme était quelque chose de très très subordonnant parce qu'un chef dans ta boîte, tu le vois de temps en temps à la machine à café quand tu arrives le matin. Là, l'algorithme, il est à la seconde. À la seconde, il est tout le temps dans ta poche en fait. On n'a plus notre patron sur le dos, comme disent les, les, les gens, mais maintenant on l'a dans la poche en fait. Et c'est quelque chose de beaucoup plus précis qui, qui, qui a des données euh, infinitésimales en fait. Sur la distance, sur la vitesse, sur la direction, sur. Euh, ils savent tout en fait de nous. La, la vitesse à laquelle on accepte une commande définit la fin qu'on a, l'envie le, le, de travailler. Donc évidemment, les gens qui acceptent vite les commandes, toutes les commandes ne refusent pas, eux, ils ont faim, donc on va leur proposer des tarifs qui seront plus bas qu'à d'autres. Ceux qui vont choisir les commandes, qui vont prendre leur temps, eux, on les chouaille, on les, on les, on les cajole, donc on va leur donner des, des... Et plus ça va, comme plus les livreurs viennent de, du, du plus profond des couches sociales, on parle de migrants, on parle de mineurs, on parle de réfugiés, euh, on parle de gens de cité qui n'ont qui sont, qui, qui plus accès euh, au salariat, ces gens-là, ont besoin de travailler, quel que soit le prix. The companies know, they absolutely know that they've got workers, um, you know, they've got a stranglehold on workers and that people are, are, are stuck. And that's why they're taking these types of low pay jobs and footing the bill for all the costs. And let's, let's face it, who of us doesn't want to have flexibility in our work? I think that that is a really an okay desire. Like that's something we should fight for. Isn't what we want to fight for a right. situation in which fl flexible work could be possible and what are the structures that need to be in place for that to be possible you know a basic income is one thing um universal protection for healthcare is another like what would it actually look like if we could have flexibility um if we could have a decent wage in which we could also make time for our families and our, you know and i think post covid i think that um a lot of young people who have gone through this are saying just no way like i'm not gonna work this type of um, wage slavery with no option at all and you know on the on the bright side of this i think maybe there are there is a world we can continue to fight for that would look um fair and equitable and perhaps that um that you know work that is parceled out in smaller chunks may be part of it um i'm not i i mean i think we have to remain optimistic that what we are fighting for is decent work for everyone that is decently paid And I think we see movements building all across the world right now, literally every place where this type of work is happening, there's workers movements growing, um, especially post COVID. And, you know, my optimism remains with the idea like what I see of co uh, cooperatives that are using platforms to organize work amongst themselves, like taking back some amount of the means of production. There is openings, cracks within um, what the technology can enable that I think can still point to a direction that could um, be salvageable. Like, you know, I think we can say like, burn it all down is number one best thing to happen. But um, is, there, is there cracks in which we can find ways for more um, to take back some of that power to um, organize it um, collectively? And I think there still are. Shannon, one of the things I really love uh, about uh, the film and also this interview is that um, you can sense your optimism here. Uh, and what you've done with the film is you've asked a fundamental question. And that is, what is it to be human? You know, what do we really want from the workplace? How can we interact with each other? Uh, and just by stoking that debate, uh, you get people thinking. And that's what we need now. Um, how optimistic are you uh, for the workers who see your film, that they'll start talking to one another and think, actually, this exploitation has to stop. Uh, and we are so uh, important to this business, we need to be treated as such. Well, I have to just say from the experience of showing the film alone, even workers who like Al um, in the US or like Leila in France are already organizing, seeing the film and that other people were organizing in different places made a huge impact on them and connecting to each other. So, you know, to me, that was really, you know, you may be organizing in your own place with your with the particular app you're working for, but seeing that people are asking the exact same questions in multiple different places 
um, I could see the sparks going off and people starting to connect with each other across borders as well. And I think that's going to be essential. So to me, these stories absolutely need to be told if we're going to build that higher level of um, organizing that because, you know, in Canada here, we had some some big wins against Fedora or workers organized and they uh, managed to win some rights and Fedora just left the country, you know, so we still have to face the fact that these are multinational companies that one country alone is not going to entirely solve it. Um, but I, I believe that everything in our world has been created by people and people's power. Um, you know, capitalism itself is created by people and so has been all of the rights that we've won around labor have also been created by people and people's actions. So um, I am a firm believer in that we create the world in which we live and all of us contribute to that. And, and I think we can't lose sight of that. This isn't an abstract machine. It's a machine built by people. Um, and there's people at every nook and cranny of it and those people um, are are humans too and so i think that there is real potential um always you know as dark as it can seem i think there is always still potential for us to change the situations in which we live through our collective power and what you've done as a filmmaker is you've uh, depicted uh, this precarious employment the exploitation within it uh, and most importantly given these workers their own language you've given them examples in their own language so they can now organize and begin to redress this balance yeah, I mean, I would say that I haven't given it to them. I've just reflected back what they're doing and hopefully brought it to a bigger audience. And um, I hope for the people who aren't organized or have, haven't have imagined that they could be seeing the, the folks that are doing the same type of work as they are articulating what the struggles are will be um, catalyzing and, you know, be uh, the beginning of what I think is going to be a long conversation around what this type of work um, is going to look like. And I think every sector will be impacted by task based work like this. It's not only delivery folks and drivers and people working for AI, it'll be every sector you can imagine from people taking care of your ailing parents on call to, uh, you know, uh, the medical profession, we're already seeing um, tasked turned into tasks. So there's a lot of thinking we need to do collectively on what that should look like. Shannon Walsh, uh, congratulations on your film, The Gig Is Up, uh, really wonderful. Uh, and uh, thank you also for your time. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you.